First part of the Introduction to the Life of Reason by George Santayana. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Fredrik Karlsson. The Life of Reason by George Santayana. Introduction. Side note progress is relative to an ideal which reflection creates whatever forces may govern human life if they are to be recognized by man must betray themselves in human experience progress in science or religion no less than in morals and art is a dramatic episode in man's career a welcome variation in his habit and state of mind although this variation may often regard or propitiate things external adjustment to which may be important for his welfare the importance of these external things as well as their existence he can establish only by the function and utility which a recognition of them may have in his life the entire history of progress is a moral drama a tale man might unfold in a great autobiography could his myriad heads and countless scintillas of consciousness conspire like the seventy alexandrian sages in a single version of the truth committed to each for interpretation what themes would prevail in such an examination of heart in what order and with what emphasis would they be recounted in which of its adventures would the human race reviewing its whole experience acknowledge a progress and a gain to answer these questions as they may be answered speculatively and provisionally by an individual is the purpose of the following work side note efficacious reflection is reason a philosopher could hardly have a higher ambition than to make himself a mouthpiece for the memory and judgment of his race yet the most cautious consideration of affairs already involves an attempt to do the same thing reflection is pregnant from the beginning with all the principles of synthesis and valuation needed in the most comprehensive criticism so soon as man ceases to be wholly immersed in sense he looks before and after he regrets and desires and the moments in which prospect or retrospect takes place constitute the reflective or representative part of his life in contrast to the unmitigated flux of sensations in which nothing ulterior is regarded representation however can hardly remain idle and merely speculative to the ideal function of envisaging the absent memory and reflection will add since they exist and constitute a new complication in being the practical function of modifying the future vital impulse however when it is modified by reflection and veers in sympathy with judgments pronounced on the past is properly called reason man's rational life consists in those moments in which reflection not only occurs but proves efficacious what is absent then works in the present and values are imputed where they cannot be felt such representation is so far from being merely speculative that its presence alone can raise bodily change to the dignity of action reflection gathers experiences together and perceives their relative worth which is as much as to say that it expresses a new attitude of will in the presence of a world better understood and turned to some purpose the limits of reflection mark those of concerted and rational action they circumscribe the field of cumulative experience or what is the same thing of profitable living side note the life of reason a name for all practical thought and all action justified by its fruits in consciousness thus if we use the word life in a eulogistic sense to designate the happy maintenance against the world of some definite ideal interest we may say with aristotle that life is reason in operation the life of reason will then be a name for that part of experience which perceives and pursues ideals 
all conduct so controlled and all sense so interpreted as to perfect natural happiness without reason as without memory there might still be pleasures and pains in existence to increase those pleasures and reduce those pains would be to introduce an improvement into the sentient world as if a devil suddenly died in hell or in heaven a new angel were created since the beings however in which these values would reside would by hypothesis know nothing of one another and since the betterment would take place unprayed for and unnoticed it could hardly be called a progress and certainly not a progress in man since man without the ideal continuity given by memory and reason would have no moral being in human progress therefore reason is not a causal instrument having its sole value in its service to sense such a betterment in sentience would not be progress unless it were a progress in reason and the increasing pleasure revealed some object that could please for without a picture of the situation from which a heightened vitality might flow the improvement could be neither remembered nor measured nor desired the life of reason is accordingly neither a mere means nor a mere incident in human progress it is the total and embodied progress itself in which the pleasures of sense are included in so far as they can be intelligently enjoyed and pursued to recount man's rational moments would be to take an inventory of all his goods for he is not himself as we say with unconscious accuracy in the others if he ever appropriates them in recollection or prophecy it is only on the ground of some physical relation which they may have to his being reason is as old as man and as prevalent as human nature for we should not recognize an animal to be human unless his instincts were to some degree conscious of their ends and rendered his ideas in that measure relevant to conduct do not amount to intelligence until the images in the mind begin to represent in some way however symbolic the forces and realities confronted in action there may well be intense consciousness in the total absence of rationality such consciousness is suggested in dreams in madness and may be found for all we know in the depths of universal nature minds peopled only by desultory visions and lusts would not have the dignity of human souls even if they seemed to pursue certain objects unerringly for that pursuit would not be illumined by any vision of its goal reason and humanity begin with the union of instinct and ideation when instinct becomes enlightened establishes values in its objects and is turned from a process into an art while at the same time consciousness becomes practical and cognitive beginning to contain some symbol or record of the coordinate realities among which it arises reason accordingly requires the fusion of two types of life commonly led in the world in well-nigh total separation one a life of impulse expressed in affairs and social passions the other a life of reflection expressed in religion science and the imitative arts in the life of reason if it were brought to perfection intelligence would be at once the universal method of practice and its continual reward all reflection would then be applicable in action and all action fruitful in happiness though this be an ideal yet every one gives it from time to time a partial embodiment when he practices useful arts when his passions happily lead him to enlightenment or when his fancy breeds visions pertinent to his ultimate good every one leads the life of reason in so far as he finds a steady light behind the world's glitter and a clear residuum of joy beneath pleasure or success no experience not to be repented of falls without its sphere every solution to a doubt in so far as it is not a new error every practical achievement not neutralized by a second maladjustment consequent upon it every consolation not the seed of another greater sorrow 
may be gathered together and built into this edifice the life of reason is the happy marriage of two elements impulse and ideation which if wholly divorced would reduce man to a brute or to a maniac the rational animal is generated by the union of these two monsters he is constituted by the ideas which have ceased to be visionary and actions which have ceased to be vain side note it is the sum of art thus the life of reason is another name for what in the widest sense of the word might be called art operations becomes art when their purpose is consciousness and their method teachable in perfect art the whole idea is creative and exists only to be embodied while every part of the product is rational and gives delightful expression to that idea like art again the life of reason is not a power but a result the spontaneous expression of liberal genius in a favoring environment both art and reason have natural sources and meet with natural checks but when a process is turned successfully into an art so that its issues have value and the ideas that accompany it become practical and cognitive reflection finding little that it cannot in some way justify and understand begins to boast that it directs and has created the world in which it finds itself so much at home thus if art could extend its sphere to include every activity in nature reason being everywhere exemplified might easily think itself omnipotent this ideal far as it is from actual realization has so dazzled men that in their religion and mythical philosophy they have often spoken as if it were already actual and efficient this anticipation amounts when taken seriously to a confusion of purposes with facts and of functions with causes a confusion which in the interests of wisdom and progress it is important to avoid but these speculative fables when we take them for what they are poetic expressions of the ideal help us to see how deeply rooted this ideal is in man's mind and afford us a standard by which to measure his approaches to the rational perfection of which he dreams for the life of reason being the sphere of all human art is man's imitation of divinity end of introduction part one